Test one, test two, test one, two, test two. Test one, two, test two. Can I clip this on you? Yeah. Do you want to run it down your shirt or outside the shirt? All right, thanks for the intro. Thanks everyone for coming. I'm really excited to talk to you guys about some of the work we've been doing on interpretable machine learning. Um, and I think this field is very interesting, it's very promising, but it's also very young and unestablished. So if you have any questions at any time, just call them out. I'm sure so many people wondering the same kinds of things. I know I am too. So let's get started. Um, so what makes interpretable machine learning important enough for us to all spend our Friday afternoons and me like all my afternoons thinking about it? Well, it all starts with prediction. So machine learning in the last couple decades has become really good at predicting different kinds of things in a supervised learning setting. So if we have a model, we can feed it a bunch of inputs and feed it a bunch of outputs and it learns to map new inputs to outputs in a really remarkable way. And we've seen successes on this across all kinds of domains. We saw a lot of this in early in image classification in different image settings. Um, we're now seeing this more and more in NLP. 
But we're also seeing this in a lot of interesting domains where we might not have expected to see machine learning and deep learning in particular succeed. So we see this in places like scientific discovery, we see it in self-driving cars, and we see it in precision medicine. And all these applications really beg the question, not only can we predict well, but can we understand what the model is doing? But at the center of all this, we have this big black box model where as models have gotten better and better at predicting, they've also gotten more and more complex and less and less easy for us to understand and explain. So this is really what interpretable machine learning is all about. It's how can we um, understand what this black box is doing in a way that allows us to kind of enter into this like second era of machine learning where we're not just asking about predictions, but we're trying to solve real world problems that have high stakes stakeholders, or we're trying to automate something like scientific discovery, where interpretation is basically the entire thing that we're after. So um, our group has been working on interpretable machine learning for quite a while now. Um, so these are some of the other students in Finn's lab that have mostly graduated now. Um, and we weren't really calling it interpretable machine learning until a few years ago. I think lots of people recently started tacking on interpretable machine learning to like their ICML abstracts and stuff just as like a buzzword to make it seem like it's a little cooler. Um, but really what we've been trying to do is like figure out what is interpretability and how can we go about it in kind of a rigorous way that really um, gets to the bottom of different applications that have real world um, impacts. So we set out to concretize kind of like what is interpretable machine learning and we ended up kind of doing this perspective paper on this. Um, that I'll go over really quickly here. It's really easy to get bogged down on like kind of vague questions because the field is a little vague, but hopefully this will help concretize some of the ideas. So some popular definitions that existed for interpretable machine learning before, you know, um, we really start stumbled into this. Um, one in this like paper that's been cited thousands of times is basically just interpretability is the ability to explain um, in understandable terms to a human. Um, which is kind of nice, but really we swapped out the word interpretable for understandable and didn't really like gain anything um, out of this. Uh, another one um, that seems to be common is lots of people conflate interpretability with all kinds of different notions that it's related to, things like trust, causality, transferability. And while these things are, um, you know, like sister fields of interpretability, interpretability might help us understand all these kinds of notions. These things aren't exactly the same as interpretability. And it's important to like kind of understand and ground what interpretability is really doing. Um, I might note that interpretations have been studied across different fields like psychology and philosophy for years before this. And this is only like this recent surge in interpretable ML that's really made it seem like this is a confusing concept for the first time. Um, so what we ended up finding um, is we still have a pretty vague definition of what interpretability is, but we hope it's a little more actionable. So the definition is something like interpretable machine learning um, is the use of machine learning models to extract relevant knowledge from uh, contained in data, um, which sounds vague, but I think the key thing to think about here is that relevance um, is defined with respect to a particular like problem, data, and audience. So once we've specified something, like we're interested in explaining something to users of self-driving cars, we can start to think about what it means to be interpretable in that setting. So it's not just, you know, we want a sparse model or we want, you know, a decision tree, it's really, oh, maybe this person cares about when the model might fail so that they can take over the navigation of the steering system or something like that. Um, so once you're in a particular domain with a, an audience and problem in mind, um, it becomes much clearer. And once we've kind of specified that, we begin to trade off predictive accuracy, which is how well the model can predict on new test data, with descriptive accuracy, um, which is not that common a term, but what we mean by it here is really the ability to describe what the model has learned. So you can imagine something simple like a linear model might be really easy to describe, um, but in certain cases like a self-driving car might have really low predictive accuracy. Um, on the flip side, you might not need a neural network if you're doing something simple. Um, and you might want you know, a small model with deep reasonable predictive accuracy that might have much worse descriptive accuracy. So the trade-off here is really mitigated by what's relevant to your problem and audience. Um, and I think grounding that will help interpretable machine learning as a field be much more serious and much more rigorous going forward and really propose things that are like useful overall. Um, so this is the end of the little high level spiel on interpretability. Does anyone have any questions on like, what are we talking about here? Okay, cool. Either everyone understood or is very confused. Hopefully we're doing well. So we're gonna, now I'm gonna talk about some of the technical work our group has been doing in this area. Um, and it's gonna focus mostly on deep learning 
Um, and a lot of the examples would be in NLP. But really what we're doing is pretty generic. We've extended these same kinds of ideas to boosted trees in random forests, as well as to other domains. And we'll get to some kind of like exciting scientific applications later on. Um, so it's roughly structured into three sections. We'll probably spend most of the time on the first and the third, where the question we're gonna try to ask is how can we interpret a single prediction that a model makes? And then by doing this, by being able to explain one prediction really well, we're gonna try to aggregate these insights up and use them to um, improve a model and like improve it in kind of interesting ways for prediction, per per um, for prediction purposes. And then we're gonna try to look at how we can aggregate these prediction level explanations into kind of global insights into a model. So starting with this first one, um, this is work that we published at iClear last year. Um, this is with me, Ben, and Jamie. And uh, here the goal was, given a neural network that's already fully trained, can we explain how it makes one prediction? Um, so more specifically, we have a setup like this, where a neural network makes one prediction, and maybe this was a text, class text classification setting, so this neural network tells us that this phrase, not very good, was negative. And now the goal is to understand how did it come to this prediction? Um, and specifically, the kind of form we want for our explanation is something like this. It's a hierarchy of features where we're interested not only in how important every individual word was, so maybe we might know that you know, the word good is positive, the word not in isolation is kind of neutral, but we're also interested in how these features interact. So when very and good come together, we get a very positive um, interaction, and we see that that assigns positive importance. And then when we finally see that not combines together with very good, um, everything becomes negative. And this kind of thing really didn't exist before we started this, this line of work, where basically all existing attribution methods are all about this bottom row, where it's how can I assign importances to individual features and have those individual feature importances sum up to the prediction. So if I make a negative prediction, then somewhere in my feature importances, um, something here has to be negative. So maybe the word not will become negative, maybe the word very will become negative. And by forcing yourself into these kinds of restricted feature importances, you kind of mess up a lot of the time what your feature importance should be. Um, so this is the overall goal of what we're trying to do. Now this is an NLP example, but there's nothing here that's actually specific to NLP. So the method I'm gonna describe would work regardless of what your input was. So if you're doing an image classification problem, instead of words, these would be pixels. Instead of phrases, these would be groups of pixels. If you're doing something in um, biology, maybe these would be genes and these would be gene interactions. So really whatever your kind of data you're working with, this kind of problem of searching for interactions um, usually exists and it can be quite interesting to explore. Okay, so um, briefly covering some of the existing methods um, for doing this kind of feature importance. Like I said, they mostly focus on that bottom level of if I have a model, it makes a prediction, how can I tell how important each individu individual feature was? So on the left, there's um, some popular methods that basically use the gradient of the model's prediction with respect to that feature. So you can imagine if I have a function like this and I wanna know the importance at this point, I can just look at if I change the feature value a little bit, how much does the model output change? Um, and this is kind of the intuition behind Lime. Um, and then you can kind of extend this kind of framework and you can end up with something like integrated gradients in these models. Um, these methods are pretty popular, um, but they have some kind of shortcomings um, the biggest one being the one I mentioned before. Is there any good saliency maps for this particular domain? Yeah, exactly. So saliency maps would be doing this for something like images where you'd be wiggling a pixel value and you'd be getting, you know, how much of the output change as a function of the pixels. Yeah. All right. Cool. Um, the second line of work, much closer to here, doesn't use gradients, but instead tries to figure out how much each feature contributes relative maybe to some baseline or to some expectation. So the Shapley value is one way to do this. Um, that kind of summarizes a bunch of differences from the mean. Um, and the work that we're gonna build off of most here is work is previous work from our lab, contextual decomposition, which tries to explicitly assign importances to interactions. Um, and previously it was kind of only focused on LSTMs and NLP, and here we're gonna make it generic. So it's gonna work for basically CNNs, um, you know, anything with like a max pool or a ReLU or a residual connection, basically any of the popular any of the popular elements in use in neural networks today. So the way this is gonna work, um, we might first think about like, what is a simple method to assign importance of a phrase, like very good, given that I have the entire input. So if my entire input is not very good, and I wanna know how important was very good as part of this phrase, 
Um, I can run it through my neural network, where I imagine each of these little rhombus things is one layer of my network, and these are my activations, and I get a prediction. Um, so I want to decompose this prediction, and one thing I might try is I might try just taking out the word not and running it through my neural network. And I could say this is the importance for very good. Um, and in fact, for this short phrase, this might actually work reasonably well, where you know, just taking out a word is like a pretty simple way to get importance for everything else. But if I have a longer sentence and I have to take out a bunch of random words, I start really quickly to get nonsensical interpretations from this kind of thing, where neural networks are very sensitive to the data they're trained on. And if I randomly remove words, it's going to randomly give me just like nonsense back. So this kind of thing really doesn't scale to anything beyond you know, a couple words, and it has to like remain semantically correct even once you remove the words. Um, similarly, something people do is I could imagine removing the words I'm interested in, so just leaving not, running it through the neural network, getting a prediction, and seeing how much it drops. And this might tell me how important was the thing that I dropped. Um, but this has basically the same problem, where if I drop words randomly from my input, I'm not necessarily going to get something semantically meaningful. So the intuition behind what we're going to do is we're going to try to combine both these approaches without suffering from this weird issue of having missing words in our input. So the way we're going to do that is we're going to start by decomposing our input into two parts, the relevant part that we care about and the irrelevant part, which is just everything else. So in this phrase, in this short example, this is two words and this is one. But in reality, you know, this could be an image, and this could be some arbitrary subset of pixels, and this could be everything else. So this is quite general. And the intuition for what we're going to do is every time we go through a layer, we're going to go through the layer by first combining these two things into the layer, but keeping track of which parts of the activations come from the relevant part and which part come from the irrelevant part. So this is a little high level. Um, and to really explain this, I need to like get into a bunch of equations, which I'm not really going to do. But the trick is basically to try to linearize different types of layers. Um, so you can imagine for the max pool layer, if I ran max pooling on this and this separately, I would pick different indexes. And then when I added these activations up, they wouldn't sum to the original activations. But if I run max pooling on the entire thing, take the indexes I get, and then use those indexes on the relevant and irrelevant um, jointly, then I will actually get something that sums back to the original activations. Um, so that's all the intuition I'm going to give on this for now. Are there any questions? I know that's a little high level, um, but maybe the math is a little too much to get into right now. Um, and at the end, if I can do this, I can do this layer by layer. I can keep track of the activations that came from the relevant part and that came from the irrelevant part. And at the end, I get an important score for the part that I cared about. Um, and this is really cool because this important score is nonlinear. So just because you know I have the importance for very and the importance for good, the importance for very good can be something that's not just the sum of those two. It can really understand the interaction between these two. Um, so this is kind of like the key um, to a lot of the methodology that we're going to like kind of be building on going forward. Um, and this is quite generic. So the way this works is we have kind of an equation. We're not really going to talk about this, but it's like each type of layer has its own set of equations that allow you to do this decomposition where you can keep track of the relevant and irrelevant even after you go through the layer. Um, but OK, we don't have to look at all these ugly equations. Um, so that was a text example. But like I said, it's fully generic. So if we wanted to know the importance of you know, some subregion of an image, we could define the relevant part as just that region, the irrelevant part as everything else. And just like we did before, go layer by layer until we get the importance for the relevant part that we're interested in. Um, so very generic, um, everything we're doing here. Cool. Um, so just as a first pass, we want to see, like, does this thing kind of work? So if we train on the SST uh, data set, which is um, a data set of a bunch of different movie reviews and whether they're positive or negative, um, we can see which words and which phrases the model thinks are the most positive and the most negative. And we see that the things it picks out do, in fact, seem to like, be positive and negative. Words like pleasurable and glorious, and negative ones like bleak and desperate and grotesque. Um, so this is at least some like, qualitative um, feeling that what we're picking up is reasonable. Um, similarly, for images, if we train a classifier on ImageNet to classify 
you know, that this snake is a green mamba, this crane is a crane. If we look at which pixels it thinks are important, it finds things around like the head of the snake and the eye that we think would be important. Similarly for the crane, we find things around the head that we think would be important for saying that this thing is a crane versus something else. Um, yeah? Uh, are you looking for different set of random number generators for all the pixels? Yeah, so this is a really good question. Here all I've done is just look at like small pixels. So I ran everything individually. So I just take pixels one by one, and say this is relevant. Exactly. So here I've done like this pixel is relevant, everything else is relevant. I do that for each pixel. Um, but yeah, we'll talk about how we can do that in a smarter way in a second. Yeah, good question. Any other questions? Yep. Yeah, so this is a really interesting question. Um, we have looked quite a bit at it. And it turns out the interpretation does not change much when you have an adversarial input, um, which is quite different from what a lot of the other kind of gradient-based methods would do. Um, and maybe I can go like into this offline with you. But yeah, it's generally just kind of what is the contribution of each feature? If you move slightly in the space, like the contribution of the feature does not change that much um, unless you move in like very specific directions. So the high level takeaway is basically just the interpretations don't change that much for an adversarial example. Yeah, good question though. Any others? All right, nice. Um, so this is some qualitative measurements. Um, oh, yep. Uh, yeah, I do. I have quite a few. Um, uh, I'll get, we'll get to it in a little bit. Yeah. All right. Cool. Um, so before we get to that, um, I promised you at the beginning that we'd have a hierarchy of features, not just you know random groupings of features. And like Ashish was saying, you know, the choice of like one pixel to be relevant and everything else to be irrelevant is kind of arbitrary. So we divide, we came up with this like simple hierarchical clustering that's just a quick way to search for interactions. Um, so what it basically does is if I have a phrase. Um, so maybe I have this sentence and I'm again doing text classification and I want to know like what are the important words and what are the important interactions in this sentence. Um, I can start by checking the score for each word by itself. So design rel define relevant to be each of these words individually. And I might get something like this where blue is more positive and orangish red is more negative. So words like great look positive, words like good are more positive. Um, and this is a real example from uh, the test data set of like an LSTM that we trained. So these like colors actually correspond to the actual scores we got. And then at the next level, once we've picked all the words, we look for groups of words, so maybe two or three words, that whose score changes the most when we pick those words compared to the individual words. So we're basically doing a greedy search for interactions. So at the next step, we pick, uh, sorry, this is a little hard to see. We pick very good and great cast what both of which become dark blue, so they're very positive, basically because they change a lot from the individual words relative to everything else. And if we keep doing this, uh, we see that things kind of get merged, and then we can see like the word not comes in and completely changes how important this phrase was. Um, and when we combine these two things, the model actually got this prediction wrong, so it failed to learn this long-term kind of negation thing where it correctly thought that this was negative, didn't really know what this was, but when it puts it together, it can't really figure it out, suggesting maybe the model is not learning these long-term dependencies. Um, so this is just an example, but yeah, there's tons of stuff like this in the text. Um, you can do the same kind of thing with images, where instead of building a hierarchy of words, you're building a hierarchy of pixels, same kind of thing goes. Um, so you mentioned some stuff about background. So um, here's an image, ImageNet model, um, and it's learned to predict that this image is a puck. It correctly predicts that. And then we ask it why it thinks this image is a puck. And we run our kind of clustering algorithm and stop at the top. It finds three kind of big clusters, two of which are skates and one of which is a puck. And it turns out you can actually like completely remove the puck from this image. Um, and it'll think, still think it's a puck because it's learned this period signal. Um, and there's tons of examples like this, some of which are like if the model, the model only actually looks at the background to classify things like whether this is a wolf or a husky or 
um, like all kinds of things like that. So you can use this to diagnose like when your model is latching onto signals that you don't think it should be. Mm -hmm. Uh, so you run it over basically whatever your inputs are. So you start at the like just unit level of your features. So if it's text, it would be words. If it's images, it would be pixels. And then you would pick, you know, basically like nearby pixels. And you would see if I add these pixels to this um, existing cluster, does the interaction score change a lot? Does that make sense? Cool. Nice. Any other questions? Uh, yeah, in the back. So, or yeah, so sorry, I didn't show it. It basically shows that you find a couple pixels like in the middle of each of these clusters first, and then you like kind of grow them bigger and bigger. And I stopped it just kind of arbitrarily here. Yeah, good question. So mm -hmm. it might be that you have more code, but you want to like decide to match the pixels somehow, or is it the, the principle of random feedback that the result will be the same? If I'll do the same exact learning principle again and again, then it's better than nothing. Yeah, so this is a really good question, and everything I've shown you so far is qualitative. Um, so yeah, let's let's talk about this. I think I have a couple slides coming on. Uh, yeah, okay, so perfect. So like nothing I've said so far really quantitatively validates what we've done. Um, and here's maybe the first quantitative evaluation I'm gonna show you today, where we wanna test whether these interpretations can really help humans do something and compare it to baseline methods. And the task we came up with is if we have a model that we know predicts well, so we trained it really well, and a second model, which is kind of a corrupted version of the first model, can the human pick, like using only the interpretation, which model will generalize better? And this might seem a little easy. So we add the constraint that the users are only allowed to look at examples for which both models predicted exactly the same. So now this becomes a pretty reasonable task where both models are predicting exactly the same on these examples, but their interpretations might be slightly different. And can we use just the interpretation to figure out which model is better? Um, and it turns out we can. Um, so these bars are for three different data sets. We're showing the percent accuracy um, of a group of humans at identifying which of the models would generalize better. Um, green is this hierarchical contextual decomposition method. Blue is also still this contextual decomposition method, um, just without the hierarchy. So it's just using it like you know pixel level maps or word level maps. Um, and then these are uh, at the time like what the best baselines were. So the integrated gradients one and the occlusion baseline, which is basically just the thing I described at the beginning, where you remove a word or something like that and see how much the prediction changes. Um, so for SST, this um, movie review data set, we see that there's a pretty significant um, improvement um, over the baselines. For MNIST, we don't really see an improvement. And maybe I think when we look back at the examples, this task does just seem like a little too easy for humans to do. And it's kind of like a wash. Like all the examples you look at and you either know or like the interpretations give you no real help. Um, and for ImageNet, it again seems like this hierarchy helps. Um, as a secondary thing, we also ask humans, like, given these different interpretations, which model they trust the most. And like, people like seem to like hierarchies and seem to like the CD scores. Um, that's not that meaningful in evaluation, but it's just kind of an auxiliary thing. Um, a lot of the limitations in people using models is often like related to trust more so than anything else. Um, so this is something else that's kind of nice to see. All right, any questions so far? Yep. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, good question. So these were all graduate students, mostly in statistics, um, some in ECHS. Um, yeah, good question. All right, nice. Um, okay, so that was pretty cool. I didn't show you like any like real examples. So like so far we've kind of been in ImageNet, MNIST land. Um, so we've kind of like shown we have a method that's kind of general purpose. Um, and now I think we're gonna get into like some more exciting examples where we're gonna dive into like how can we use this in a real problem. Um, so this is some work that mostly Laura did um, using these interpretations to improve neural networks. And by improve, I mean improve like in some sense of predictive accuracy. Um, so I'll just dive into it. The idea behind this work was like super simple. Once you like understand all the stuff that I um, talked about, um, it's really um, a normal neural network just trains with a prediction and label and you have some kind of supervised loss. Um, but if you know something about what you expect the interpretation of your model to be, you can go further than this and you can try to directly penalize some property 
of the explanation you have here. Um, so just like supervised learning, during training, you can um, alter the model. And by doing so, you can hope to get some kind of better generalization performance. Um, now note, you don't always need to have, you know, like an explanation for every example in order to do this. And I'll talk about some kind of examples that'll make this clearer. Um, so all this loss function is doing is you take the training loss and you add some kind of, and you add this extra loss basically saying, I want my explanation to exhibit this kind of property. So, simple example of this. Um, this is kind of a toy example, but I think it's nicely illustrative of what this can do. If I train a model uh, to do digit classification on this data set, so this is just MNIST, but we like change the colors of different digits to be different, um, and then I test it on the same shapes, but different colors. So I just like inverted the color. Um, I don't know, maybe a computer ver vision person would expect this. Um, you get 0.2% accuracy at this test. Um, and this isn't like 20%, this is like literally like 0.2%. So the model completely learns to look at the color and completely ignores the shape. Um, and if you try kind of like what the existing baseline for like doing something like using explanations is, which is penalizing gradients of the model, you like don't improve at all. So you still stay at exactly this 0.2%. Um, so the way we're gonna try to improve this is we're gonna take that CD score that I just described. Um, we're not gonna use the hierarchy. We're gonna look at individual pixels and we're gonna tell the neural network that no individual pixel score should be important on its own. So basically all individual important scores should be close to zero. And what that forces the model to do is it can't use any individual pixel by itself, it's only allowed to use interactions between pixels. And when we do that, um, uh, we can get better. This is still not like a great number, this is still 31%, um, but this is like way better than what existing baselines were able to do at the time. And in fact, if instead of saying don't use one pixel, um, we also say things like don't use two by two patches of pixels, um, we can get this to generalize better and better and get up to like close to 90% accuracy. So this kind of framework is nice because we can embed prior knowledge into the neural network, something like don't use individual pixels, use longer um, range importances, longer range dependencies, um, that would otherwise be almost impossible to tell a neural network to do explicitly. Um, so it's just a nice kind of soft way to do it. And it also doesn't require any like extra labeling by human or anything like that. It's just kind of a trick that allows you to embed human knowledge. Um, this example is pretty toy, but um, it's related to a pretty real problem in computer vision where, especially on models like ImageNet or data sets like ImageNet, a lot of models tend to look at really local features, so things like texture, um, instead of kind of the things it should be looking at, like larger scale shapes and objects. Um, we have some results basically showing that this exact same approach can help mitigate that a lot. So you can help force a model to look at shape instead of texture. Um, I won't go into that too much, but okay. Um, we can do a similar thing. Okay, maybe I'll skip this. Similar thing, forcing a model not to look at gender biases in NLP. Um, and maybe this is a more important application. This is a pretty popular computer vision data set called ISIC, where the task is to classify whether these images of um, tumors are benign or malignant. Um, so benign ones kind of look like this, malignant ones look like this. It's pretty hard for us as a human, like without expertise to really know which is which. But there's this weird thing in this data set where a lot of the benign images have this patch in them that's kind of strange. Um, and this only really happens in the benign images and not in the malignant in images. So when you train models, and tons of people have trained models on this data set, they learn this spurious correlation and they latch on to, like, is this patch present? If this patch is present, always predict benign. Even though in the real world, there's no reason for that to be the case. Um, so what we can do is we can go in and easily find these patches using like standard OpenCV stuff, just like look for stuff that's all the same color and isn't skin colored. And we can tell the model like place zero importance in this region. And when we do this, we can improve the predictive accuracy. Um, so these F1 scores go up. Um, I think this number is actually a little higher now um, where once you do the penalization, it's a little better. And this is on the entire data set. If you look at the images like with patches in them, it's like 100% better. Like it will learn um, if the patch is present without regularization, it will always predict benign. Now it'll kind of look at everything else. Um, and these are saliency maps. 
from before and after. So before, if you take a testing image, look at the saliency map, there's a lot of like brighter, which means more important saliency around the patch. And afterwards, it's basically completely gone. Um, and we see the same thing over here. Um, is there a question in the back? Yep. So do you mean like have like a layer in the neural network that does that? So if you so if you set the pixel values to zero, it doesn't actually mean it can't see it, right? In fact, it means it sees it really strongly as a zero signal. Oh, I see. So you mean like omit the images that have patches, basically? Um, yeah. So you can do this. Um, it turns out if you do something like that, you get worse performance, and it's basically because there's so many of these patches in the training data that you throw away a lot of your training data. Um, but you're right. In general, like if you have noisy signals in your images or in your data, you can try to throw it away. This is basically a technique for if you have some kind of spurious signal that you want to avoid, can you remove it? Yep. Uh, how do you define those patches? And if you know how to define them, can you just ignore them, clear the whole thing, so to speak, and still be able to see what you have in there? Yeah, so I think this is really related to the previous question, where you can throw it away. So you can find images with patches relatively easily with like standard OpenCV type stuff. Um, and you can throw it away and not train on it. But if you do. Not when you train the images. Like, you train the images, but then. Oh. Like, just like how you would remove the patch. I see. So, you mean removing the patch and, like, imputing it with a GAN or something like that? Is that what you mean? Um, not talking about the implementation of it, though, but just how they have patches or, like, what they have in there. Like, that's what I'm trying to get you at. Yeah. So, yeah, that is something you could do. And we haven't really explored that. But, yeah, there might be a way to just, like, yeah, fill them in with like a generative model somehow that can achieve the same kind of goal. Yeah, good point. All right, any other questions, comments? Cool. Um, so I think that was all I was going to talk about for this line of work. So this is the thing I'm most excited about right now. Um, and this is really using this for like science. So we have some cosmology collaborators um, who came to us with some questions that we realized were very similar to the kinds of problems we've been working on, um, but they have a much more like serious need for the interpretation than the kinds of things we've been doing so far. So basically what their problem is, is they have, um, they, there's like new uh, telescopes that are taking really large scale recordings of what the sky looks like, and their goal is to infer certain cosmological parameters, things like how much dark matter is in the universe, and what is the total matter density in the universe from these images. Um, however, they don't know what these parameters are to start with, so all they can do is they can assume it know if they knew what the parameter was, they have a forward model for simulating basically what the universe should look like. So here omega m is one parameter, the total matter density in the universe, and they have these really complicated differential equation models that tell them what would the resulting what a resulting galaxy might look like if we assume something about this parameter value, and then they try to do the inverse of this model, um, and it turns out that the best thing to do this are neural networks. <laughs> uh, so uh, they can train these really big models, and they do tons of simulations, and then they try to predict back what this parameter was in the first place. And if you run enough simulations, you can get a model that you hope generalizes to the images that you see in real life. Um, but now a big question for them is, how good are the simulations we're getting? And what is this model learning? Because it's possible that this model is latching onto some simulation artifacts in such a way that it isn't really learning any of the relevant stuff in this image. It's just latching onto something that might be a problem, and then we can't trust any of these downstream results. So the question really is, like, what did this learn, and was it reasonable? Um, and interestingly, if you just look at the pixel domain, they really don't know what should be that important. Um, like, firstly, because no one has time to like look through just millions of images like this for the interpretations. Um, but second, because the way these things work, or the way these images are generated, a more natural domain for interpretation is actually the frequency domain. So what I'm showing here in these like very difficult to see plots are the um, the original image, but bandpass filtered for different frequencies. 
So if I look at frequencies only at this angular moment, um, uh, so this is just a unit of frequency that they like to use, um, then I get these kind of larger blobs. And as you go higher and higher, you see things get kind of higher and higher frequency and become smaller and smaller. And these different frequencies correspond to different known things in the universe. So things like galaxy clusters and things like um, uh, kind of sporadic mass in the universe that they can know and interpret in this space. Um, so really, instead of doing pixels and the kind of things we were doing before, we now want to shift our interpretations over into this new frequency domain. Um, and it turns out it's not so difficult to do this. So the framework I had before, all we really needed to do is define a relevant part and an irrelevant part. Um, and instead of doing just kind of a binary mass, like this pixel is important and these pixels are not, now we can say, do a bandpass filter on the original image, take that to be the relevant part, and then take the difference between the original image and define that to be the irrelevant part. And this is really cool, because now we can get importances basically in any domain we're interested in, just by doing this kind of like trick to specify what the relevant part is. Um, when we run this through, we can get importance for basically what was for this frequency. Um, does that make sense to everyone? Yep. Um, so I'm talking about the Fourier domain in the image. The frequencies in that image do correspond to actual like frequencies in space, like based on what the telescope observed. Um, does that make sense? So this is not like actual, what this image represents is a like mass of map, is a map of mass in space. So it's like if I was standing here looking at something very far away, all the mass that was in the way will kind of bend the light as it comes from those things to me. And if I just sum all those things up and project them onto me, I get this image, and we're looking at the frequencies in this image space. Um, so it corresponds to a physical quantity that's not exactly you know, just a frequency of light waves. Um, no, so once we've done this mass projection, it's just one. Yeah, good question. Cool, any more? Nice, so yeah, now we're able to assign importance to frequencies. Um, and it turns out if we do this for each frequency one by one, where we change the um, center of the bandpass filter and we look at the importance, we get curves like this. And this for us was a really exciting result. If you're not a cosmologist, this probably doesn't mean anything. <laughs> but um, it turns out that these frequencies were precisely the ones that they um, thought the model should be using. Um, and they found interesting things where it looks like this is kind of multimodal, right? There's like different kind of bands within this plot. Um, and if you separate out the bands by the values of the parameter, you can see that they follow kind of different looking curves. So at really low values of total matter density, all frequencies are roughly um, equivalently important. But as you increase it more and more, the frequencies that you'd expect become more and more important. So for them, this was a really good validation that their simulations were working as expected. Um, and it's a secondary thing what we're looking into now is because these simulations are so expensive to compute and all we're doing with them is downstream like just this task prediction, we might be able to like um, do less simulation here, save like a bunch of time, but cover a much wider set of images by just like putting less emphasis on the simulations at these really high frequencies that might not really be necessary. Um, so for them, this was really cool. I think this is really cool. Um, and What's nice about it is even though we were just looking at frequencies here, this kind of setup is pretty general. So all we really need to do is do like a simple reparameterization of our model. So if we have a model f of x um, and we have some transformation t theta and we're interested in understanding our input in a transform space. So instead of taking say the pixel space, we're interested in doing the Fourier transform and looking at the frequency space. All we need to do is append the inverse transform or something approximating it to our model. And now we have a new model like that's basically in the space that we're interested in. So we have a model, even though we didn't train it on something like frequencies, we can pretend like our model is a function of frequencies. Does that make sense? This is like maybe not a great schematic. I'm not sure how to make it better. Um, maybe just an actual FFT schematic. But what's nice about this is now, like any transformation, we can like assign importance to, um, and this becomes quite cool. We can also use things that aren't just that CD method, so we can compare against things like 
um, integrated gradients or the Shapley values, so those things that I was talking about before, because now we're just interpreting a function in a different space. Um, so one of the ways we evaluated this was by using simulated data. So if I assume I have some real, um, some known data and some known importance score, so maybe I know only one frequency is important, um, and I generate data from that, then I can train a model and look at the importance of that model and see basically does it recover this ground truth importance. Um, so this is like a pretty common thing done in cosmology and this is basically, and in causal inference, basically just can we recover, recover ground truth known importances? And it turns out using that kind of like setup I showed before, we can, so this is the error um, in percent of the fraction of time we correctly identify the correct frequency. Um, so CD works the best, but all these other methods still work pretty well if we do that reparameterization trick I talked about. Um, this is just one table. The kinds of simulations we do are really big, so we have like a ton of different simulations with different data generating distributions, but it seems like overall this method really seems to work pretty well. Um, so we're pretty happy and we're really excited about kind of exploring different types of transformations we can do. Um, so a quick recap on just evaluation we did. I know I talked for a while, but I think at this point we like really come to like these kind of ACE uh, contextual decomposition scores. Um, we started evaluating them just kind of qualitatively, but over time we've done a lot more. Um, we've like done these human experiments. We've shown that we can improve predictive accuracy with them, that we can recover ground truth in simulations. And there's a bunch of stuff I didn't talk about, stuff like the adversarial examples that we've looked into. Um, so we're looking at how can we make this, you know, really rigorous? How can we like show that this method works? Um, we can do like proofs for it recovering things in certain types of settings, but nothing will kind of really work in general. So this is like the kind of road we're taking. And I think we'll keep adding to this list as we make this more and more general. Um, so just to conclude, I think I'll, I'll skip some of the like fun qualitative examples. Actually, all right, let's do one fun qualitative <laughs> example. Um, so if I train a fake news classifier on text and I wanna know like what is important for this fake news classifier, um, instead of looking at just the like individual words that it uses, which could be very long across a bunch of different um, examples, I can do a topic model transfer transformation. So here you just run LDA on this data set and these are the topics you get where this first one is just showing the top 10 words in the first topic the second one is showing the top 10 words in the second topic. Um, and then I can look at the mean importance for each of these topics. So it's basically how much, on average, is this topic contributing more to the classifier saying it's fake or not? And like the one that looks the fakest kind of looks like it has some fake words in there. It's got like Hillary campaign emails, um, <laughs> email. Um, so this kind of thing is cool. You can do like really generic transformations. You can do topic modeling. You can do like NMF, you can do LDA. So there's like a lot of cool things you can do. Um, so yeah, just to conclude some questions we're thinking about right now, like how, how can you decide which transformation is important? Can you learn the transformation that's important by you know parameterizing the transformation, um, maybe making it explicitly disentangled, um, putting on some kind of mutual information constraints or independence constraints? Um, can we do this kind of transformation to learn the kinds of masks we were doing with this like hierarchy before, kind of heuristically? Um, how can we like quickly summarize these scores across by using transformation so that we don't have to look at in images one by one? We can just kind of look at aggregate metrics. And really the like lofty goal here is how can we get from these kinds of interpretation techniques to doing something like causal inference? Like if we wanna do science using machine learning, we need a way to have scores that we trust, that we validate, um, and that we believe suggests something real in the model. Um, so with that, yeah, here are just um, some of my collaborators again, Ben, who's been a great advisor, and Jamie in particular, who I've worked with very closely, um, and then a couple of graduate students from our lab, Laura, who worked on the regularization stuff, um, and some of the people working with me on the cosmology project, um, and then yeah, some different groups, Bear, Ben's group, everyone for the helpful discussions, um, Eeks and TMG, just some of my friends um, who have helped me work on a lot of these stuff. So yeah, thanks. <laughs> All right. So yeah, we've got a couple minutes if people have questions. Or I'll um, back real quick. All right. Yeah, question. Does anyone have a question? And if not, I'll, I'll ask. Okay, I'm gonna jump more in. Um, 
So I'm really curious. The hierarchical organization of chefs, um, you know, to create things is are important. It's really interesting to me. But is it possible to learn, I guess, which, for example, words to compose? Or do you need to compose, like, every combination to find, you know, something that's meaningful or not meaningful? Yeah, so this is a really good question. Um, you know, the possible subsets of words you could pick is, like, enormous. And what we did was kind of like a greedy search. Um, actually, learning a search is something, I it's interesting. We haven't really thought about it. Um, what we have thought about is learning just, like, if you want to find the smallest subset that has the biggest importance or something like that, I think it's pretty easy to formulate that kind of thing as an optimization problem, and it's kind of related to this transformation setting. Um, learning the entire hierarchy is I heard a interesting. Form of hierarchy from a chef. Yeah. yeah. So yes, it sounds really cool. I don't, I don't know. Maybe some NLP people have <laughs> insights on that from <laughs> syntax tree type stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, so they weren't. It was just an LSTM trained on SSTs, which is pretty small. Um, I will say those examples I kind of like picked to be like, oh look, this kind of does what we're doing. But a lot of times you find that the model is doing something like completely random, but ends up with the right prediction somehow. So maybe those cases are actually the ones where um, like it's the most important to look at the interpretations to really understand what the model is doing. But I think yeah, when it gets everything right and you have a really good model, it does look a lot like kind of like a syntax tree or something like that. Like what you might construct by hand. Yeah, so this is a really interesting question. We have thought about it quite a bit. Um, and I think it's like a curious question. If you want to know how important a region is, and you talk about like filling it in from other pixels, when things are correlated with other things, their importance individually becomes very kind of confusing. So for example, if I like have a duck and I remove its head, and then I fill it in and I get another duck, it might seem like the duck's head was not at all important for this being a duck because I could have just predicted it from the rest of the pixels. But we kind of know like that's just because the features were correlated, the duck head does actually matter for saying that this is a duck. So you end up with a lot of problems with correlated features when you do stuff like that, but it is kind of like an interesting thing to think about. When you have like some kind of uncorrelated space, maybe like this frequency space, then that becomes really useful, and that's kind of like what a lot of causal inference techniques do. Yeah, good question. Any more questions? All right, uh, it doesn't look like there are any more questions, so let's uh, thank the speaker one more time. Thanks.